Repo market flashes code red again. Is this signaling a financial crisis? I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over the last repo blow up in September 2019. We'll call it repo blow up 1.0. So let's start by reviewing how the repo market actually works. Transactions between the banks, here we've got bank one, two, and three, hedge funds, financial institutions, it's all the entities that are in the financial economy. Usually what they're doing is trading collateral for cash. If the transaction occurs between the banks themselves, sometimes they'll trade bank reserves. This collateral is treasuries, mortgage-backed securities. Now it can be asset-backed securities. It can literally be anything almost that's on the bank's balance sheet. But usually they want to accept treasuries. That's the pristine collateral. We'll get into that in a moment or mortgage-backed securities. The transaction or the borrowing of money for collateral is for a set term. It could be an overnight repo, two weeks, one month, three months, whatever the two entities decide, but usually it's short term. So let's go over the basics as to how this would work. We've got a hedge fund that needs money overnight. They need liquidity, they need cash. They've got treasuries on their balance sheet, so they will pledge those treasuries for the cash they need. They'll use these treasuries as collateral. Bank One has the ability to lend the additional cash to the hedge fund, so they'll just do a swap. Those treasuries will go to the bank and the money, the cash, will go to the hedge fund. If it's overnight, the very next day, they'll just swap and the bank will charge the hedge fund an interest rate, usually, <laughs> We're going to get into how this has been turned upside down in just a moment. But usually the bank will charge the hedge fund an interest rate. They'll swap back the next day. The trade is done. The hedge fund gets the cash they need. The bank has the collateral to secure the transaction. I'd also like to point out the transaction can be between the banks themselves. And when the repo market blew up, interest rates spiked to almost 10% in September of 2019, the Fed came in and did what in essence is quantitative easing. <laughs> but they said, whatever you do, don't call it quantitative easing. Don't call it QE. This is not QE. <laughs> so everyone on FinTwit just started calling it not QE because that's what Jerome Powell told us to do. But what the Fed would do is create bank reserves, funny money out of thin air, they would buy the treasuries from the banking system so they would have more bank reserves to prompt them to lend into the repo market to bring those interest rates or the demand for cash down with additional supply. So now let's think through what makes repo rates go up or down so we can put all the pieces of the puzzle together in step two and three. And in step two, I'm going to reveal exactly what has been happening in the repo market that is flashing this code red signal. It's a different signal than we saw back in September 2019. In fact, it's the complete opposite. So what would make interest rates in the repo market actually go up? There would have to be a higher demand for cash than the supply. So there's a supply demand imbalance. Also, Counterparty risk. And this is something that we talked about in all of my repo market videos before. So you can check those out. We'll put a link to some of those in the description before because I've done probably 10 of them. But let's just assume that there was enough cash in the system to meet supply. And you're one of these banks that's lending to an institution. But you know darn well one of these institutions is on the brink of insolvency. They're very close to going bust. Well, even if you had the cash, you're not going to lend it to them because of the counterparty risk. Therefore, those banks that needed the cash would say, I'll pay more and more and more and more for the cash that you have on your balance sheet that would increase the interest rate because the interest rate is just the cost to borrow the money. 
Also, there might not be enough pristine collateral. And Jeff Snyder, my good buddy, has talked about this all the time. Let's just say that the hedge fund needed cash overnight, but they didn't have any treasuries. All they had was toxic sludge. <laughs> Using that term from Jeff Snyder himself, some of these asset-backed securities, which in 2019 I jokingly called oceanfront property in Arizona. But an example of toxic sludge, not only asset-backed securities, but maybe treasuries that the bank, the counterparty, knows have been rehypothecated. And I'm not going to get into the details of rehypothecation, but basically you can't tell who owns that treasury. So the hedge fund could have borrowed the treasury from their buddy at the financial institution and then pledged it as collateral to the bank. But the banker knows that it's not the hedge fund manager's treasury. that He just borrowed it from his good buddy. So he says, no way, I'm not going to take that collateral. It's toxic sludge because it's been rehypothecated. The hedge fund manager can't get the cash they need. So they say they'll pay a higher and higher price. The price of money is the interest rate. So rates go up. Or there's just low levels of liquidity in the system. That's the basic answer, that there's a higher amount of demand than there is supply. It's just a supply imbalance. If there's more demand than supply, the interest rates go up. But what could make the interest rates go down? In fact, go down so far, they get into negative territory. That's right. Lately, the repo market has been trading with negative interest rates. The entities are paying other entities to borrow money from them. So you kind of scratch your head and say, okay, how on earth is that possible? Well, the way interest rates go down, pretty much the opposite of the way they go up, <laughs> there's going to be more supply than there is demand. But another reason could be there's demand for the collateral itself. Step number two, repo market twilight zone. As I said in step number one, you heard me correctly, interest rates in the repo market have gone negative. And this is a result of there being demand for the collateral that's being traded in the repo market. So usually what happens in the repo market is the entities need cash. So they'll say, we'll pay you an interest rate to borrow the cash and to back up the transaction, we'll give you a treasury as collateral. But now what they're saying is we want the collateral. We want to borrow the collateral. So we will pay you to borrow our cash so effectively we can borrow the treasury. It's completely switched. You see, before they would give collateral to borrow cash. Now they're giving cash so they can borrow collateral. In fact, they're paying entities to borrow the cash. So you may be scratching your head right now and saying, okay, this is definitely the twilight zone, George, but why on earth would the entities do this? For more insight, let's go to a clip from one of my favorite podcasts out there from my good buddies, Jeff Snyder and Emil Kalinowski. It's called Making Sense. Editor, let's cut to the clip. The article that we're going to be referencing for everyone is Deja Vu, Treasury Shorts Meet Treasury Shortages. And you begin, Jeff, by telling us that one of the reasons why this might be happening is because investors might be short bonds. Can you tell us the story of uh, why are investors short bonds? No, it's the same thing as shorting stocks, right? You're betting on the price to go down. So if you sell something today, you're hoping that you can buy it back in the future at a much lower price, profiting the, profiting the difference. And it's no different. Speculators operate, you know, speculators are going to short uh, betting on the price declines in any market they can possibly find, including the U.S. Treasury market. And so if you believe that the 10-year U.S. Treasury, for example, is primed for a fall in price, which would be rising yields, you might short that section under the curve and heavily short it. 
And that's indeed what, again, it's a regular part of the marketplace. There's always speculative shorts in any marketplace that are looking to profit, you know, either short term or longer term, intermediate term on price movements, uh, price movements that they can take advantage of. And when you're shorting a, a treasury bond, just like shorting a stock, you have to borrow the security in order to sell it and then at later time cover that, that short sale. That's right. Instead of buying first and later selling high, you reverse the process. You sell high and then buy back later, but you don't own it. So how can you sell it? You borrow it. Who, what repositories have bushels of these treasury securities? Well, the biggest source of treasuries in the world is the Federal Reserve. There's some a portfolio, but that's no good because that's just locked up in bureaucratic mess. <laughs> yes, they have a reverse repo, but you're not going to get you're not going to get treasuries from the Fed. So then you, you can only go to pension funds, insurance companies, people who are, uh, institutions that have large static portfolios of securities because they have to. But you can't go to a pension fund and say, "Hey, I want to borrow your treasury." You have to work through a dealer. So the dealer is the one who has a securities lending business that's set up for decades and has been transacting with uh, pension funds and insurance companies and other foreign, um, what they call silos, that have available securities that can be lent out. So through the securities lending business of bank dealers, that's where you go to get your short, where you get to borrow the treasury security you don't own to sell into the marketplace to try to profit on a declining price. So what's happening is entities in the financial economy are trying to get their hands on treasuries so they can short the treasuries. They can sell them into the market and buy them back at a cheaper price. But where are they going to get all the treasuries they need? The repo market. So what happens is an entity, in this case we'll say it's bank number one, goes to the hedge fund and says, hey, hedge fund, do you need some money? Because we want your treasuries. And the hedge fund says, eh, not really. I'm loaded up. We got our stimmy checks from the Fed, so we are good to go. <laughs> we got our PPP loan. And the bank says, listen, we really want those treasuries, so we will pay you to take a billion dollars. Well, if they're paying for the hedge fund to take a billion dollars or to borrow a billion dollars, that's a negative interest rate. So the hedge fund says, fine, if you want to pay us to take a billion dollars, if you want to give us a negative interest rate, we'll take it. So the bank sends them the billion dollars. The hedge fund gives them the treasuries. That's what the bank, bank number one, wanted in the first place because they think interest rates on those treasuries are going up. You heard it just yesterday. The Fed came out and said, we are not going to raise interest rates. So they think there's going to be consumer price inflation. The CPI goes up. That makes bond prices go down if the yields are going up. So let's look at this simple yield curve. It starts at one month, three month, one year, 10 year, 30 year. As most of you know from watching my videos, the yield curve has been steepening, which means the 10-year and the 30-year interest rates have been going up significantly, where the short end of the curve, let's say the one month and the three month, has stayed very low, close to zero. So if you are a bank and you believed that interest rates were going to continue to go up, go buzz light year to infinity and beyond, <laughs> you would want to get those treasuries any way you could sell them into the treasury market and buy them back at a later time when interest rates have gone up, prices have gone down, so the bank pockets the spread. The idea, of course, would be to borrow the treasury, to sell into the treasury market, buy it back, and your return on that trade would be higher than the rate of interest you have to pay the hedge fund the negative interest rate for borrowing the money in the first place. And this is why I've called this step the repo market twilight zone. Now you know why the repo market has been trading with negative interest rates, flashing this code red sign. But the question still remains, 
Does this potentially signal a financial crisis that could lead to an economic collapse? Step number three, the government and the Fed adding fuel to the fire. You're going to want to sit down, buckle up, pour yourself that stiff drink because we're going to connect the dots. And I can almost promise you the conclusions that we reveal are going to shock you. So we've transitioned from the repo market describing that. Now we're going over the process of quantitative easing. And I'd like to remind you that currently the Fed is doing $120 billion worth of quantitative easing. $80 billion of that is where they are buying treasuries from the commercial banking system. So let's think that through. The Fed goes to the banks and says, hey, we need to buy those treasuries. We need interest rates down. We need to make sure that we are manipulating <laughs> the price of money as much as we can. So the banks sell the Fed the treasuries. It's an asset swap. The bank gives them the treasuries. The Fed prints up more bank reserves, more funny money, and puts that onto the balance sheet of the bank. So the balance sheet of the Fed, on the left we have assets, on the right liabilities. The Fed's asset side of their balance sheet accumulates all of these treasuries. Well, what was the problem that we went over in step number two that took interest rates in the repo market negative? The problem was an imbalance of bank reserves and treasuries. Not enough treasuries, way, 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 way too many bank reserves. My point is the Fed is exacerbating the problem because they're taking those treasuries out of the system. And they're replacing it with the bank reserves that the market is telling us there's an excess of. Now, to add insult to injury, Janet Yellen is coming in and saying that she's going to spend $1.1 trillion out of the TGA, the Treasury General Account. So basically, what she's doing is saying to the marketplace, instead of auctioning more treasuries to get the money we need to pay for Joe Biden's stimulus package, we're going to go ahead and just spend the money out of our checking account, the TGA, which is held at the Fed. But by spending the money out of the TGA, instead of issuing new treasuries at auction, what is she doing? She's depriving the market of more of that collateral or more of the treasuries it needs to function properly. Taking it to the next step, what if we get a government gridlock? We know that they've issued the $1.9 trillion stimulus package, but what's next? Let's just assume for a moment they can't issue another $5 trillion stimulus package, $10 trillion, whatever it is they want for the Green New Deal, etc. We get a government gridlock. If they can't push through another stimulus package, that means fewer treasuries being auctioned and less collateral going into the market, again, exacerbating the problem of the imbalance between bank reserves and treasuries. Okay, now that we understand that, let's go back to step number two. And remember, the banks are borrowing treasuries out of the repo market by lending cash at a negative interest rate. <laughs> They're paying people to borrow cash so they can borrow the treasuries. They borrow those treasuries, they sell those treasuries into the market, hoping to buy them back at a lower price in the future. But remember, all those treasuries are going to the balance sheet of the Fed. And we potentially have a situation where they're not going to be issuing any more supply of those treasuries. So if the interest rates on the yield curve actually go down instead of up, 
because now the Fed is buying all those treasuries, therefore making this, the treasuries that are still in the marketplace even more valuable. If they're more valuable, the interest rates go down because the price is going up. So then the banks that are short treasuries are going to have to buy those back as quickly as they can because they're losing money on the trade. And you guys know exactly what this is called because of all the drama recently with GameStop. This is a short squeeze. So we could have a short squeeze in the treasury market with all these banks that have borrowed treasuries from repo, lending them into the treasury market because the Fed buys <laughs> all these treasuries and there's so low supply and Yellen isn't supplying anymore. The government could not supply any more treasuries at auction because they're in gridlock. Therefore, yields go down. Banks are screwed. They got to buy them back at any price. Again, that's the definition of a short squeeze. So you could be saying to yourself, okay, George, well, that's fantastic because that's achieving the Fed's mission of bringing down interest rates on the yield curve, therefore bringing down interest rates in the real economy. Oh, but wait, there is more. <laughs> that presents a huge problem because the repo market doesn't have the collateral it needs to function properly. This is where the world economy gets the dollars it needs to function properly. So if the world isn't getting sufficient dollars, we've got big problems, not just with the global economy, but also the domestic economy here in the United States. So most likely the repo market would try to solve this problem. They'd have a shortage of collateral. What have they done in the past? Well, instead of using those treasuries, they'll use the toxic sludge. So this makes the system less vibrant and it makes the system far less stable. Also, they're going to start rehypothecating the existing treasuries to a greater extent than they already are. So let's say the treasury is borrowed by the hedge fund from the financial institution, like the example we use in step number one. Now the hedge fund is going to borrow from the financial institution to lend to another hedge fund that's going to lend to another financial institution that's going to lend to another hedge fund. So my point is in the past, the treasury might have changed hands two times. So the two entities were using the same treasury on their balance sheet, claiming ownership. Now it could be happening 10 times, 20 times, which as you can imagine, makes the entire system far less stable. And let's just assume for a moment that the counterparties involved with repo didn't accept the toxic sludge or the rehypothecated treasuries that were in existence circulating that the Fed hasn't already taken onto their balance sheet, this creates a shortage of dollars in the global economy. If there's a shortage of dollars, demand goes up, supply down, price of dollars goes up. Therefore, the DXY skyrockets. You could see it going to 110, 120, 130, where, like Brent Johnson has talked about in the past, the global leaders have to come together and come up with a Plaza Accord 2.0. So is the repo market flashing a code red that could signal a financial crisis leading to an economic collapse? Yes and no. If it was just the repo market, it wouldn't be a big deal. But because of the intervention of the Fed, the government, and the central planners, this could be a complete non-issue that the market would handle on its own, turned in to a GFC, Global Financial Crisis 2.0. And I want to be very clear, what I'm describing here is not a prediction. It's simply going over the possibilities so you at home watching this video can make better, more educated financial decisions for your future.
for more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments. Check out this playlist right here, and I will see you on the next video.